Nice. Thank you very much, Bob. You got the sound perfect. My name is Charles Sterling. I'm here with Marcel de Vries. Marcel is a regional director, MVP from the Netherlands. Just actually did a big gig um, for cloud load testing. Um, and a big friend. He comes over to the house all the time when he's in town. So I actually had a couple of pre announcements why I'm going to start early. First of all, if you actually um, want to help with the user interface and the interaction of Application Insights, Jeremy Barksdale is in the back corner, back over there. He actually does quick pull studies. Uh, we tend to do these at Microsoft, but he can actually arrange these virtually. What he does is he gives you guys access to our latest sprint effort. So sometimes mid sprint, he'll go out and pull a build out and have you guys look at it and tell us what you think as far as our work. This is a big deal going forward because the next two sprints are all about um, fixing our user interface. You guys saw the Ibiza effort yesterday, right? You saw that? So we're actually going to make sure that we snap into Ibiza really well and make sure that it's as useful as it can be. Um, so the Ibiza thing is for people that are not insiders in Microsoft, the portal, the Azure portal? Oh, yeah, they didn't use that word. No. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's the synthesis of the Visual Studio Online and the Azure portal. Thank you, Marcel. Yeah. Um, was the movie pretty good last night? Was that a good movie? Sure. Yeah? So raise of hands. Who, who thought it was a great movie? Okay, I got to see it. Uh, me and Marcel will actually, we thought we'd test drive this to see if we know what the heck we're going to be doing. So that's why we missed the movie. Um, also, I want to thank you very much. Again, 9 a.m. after the night of the party at the end of the conference. It's a big deal. But I did learn something as a result. If you actually want this position, which is the absolute worst position in a conference, all you have to do is comment on Brian Keller's receding hairline. That's, that's all there is to it. Um, as I said, my name is Charles Sterling. I've been in the developer division for 24 years, November 24 years. I learned something else, that one out of every four 24-year 24 24 year veteran at Microsoft is a millionaire, one out of four. Interesting, so yeah. you're a millionaire, right? And I also learned that the other three of us are bitter about that one guy. <laughs> OK, guys. Um, we have slides. Is it OK if we actually don't use them or don't use them very much? All right. So let's go ahead and get right to the demo machine. The agenda is pretty complicated. It's three pieces. I, I usually can't count higher than three. We're going to take a look at load testing from yesterday, right? What's been available? What's out there? And I'm going to talk to you why we're going to cover that off. I think it's so important. Load testing as of today. Today defined by November 13th at launch last year. And then load testing going forward. What are the things that we're actually going to add um, going forward in the next couple of sprints? Probably won't go further than the next couple of sprints. And what Marcel has already got is Visual Studio Open. Thank you, Marcel. And what we're going to do is we're going to create an on-premise load test. So. Does anybody know how to start? File new in Visual Studio. That's where we get started at build, right? And we're going to choose load tests. Oh, actually, he's going to do uh, add new project to an existing application. Me and the load test um, PM, his name is Modest. We created a little while ago. So he's going to add in an existing project or a new project. New project. And we're going to add a load test project. You guys see the load test project? There isn't one, right? You actually add web and performance tests. So we make it really difficult for you to find. I think that's one of the reasons we don't have as many people using our load test features, just because it's hard to find. OK, at this point, what he actually has is a web recorder. So we're going to go ahead and record our interaction at the protocol level. So it's really, inter it's really important that you guys know that this is on the wire. This is not the user interface. This is not the interactions. And right off the bat, we're going to go to Bing, and we're going to see if me and Monis's game, we're actually running the phone frog app, has actually managed to catch the website yet. We got pictures of frogs, but our, our game isn't there. Nope. But this load test is about taking a look at some of the pages that Modest said he's actually gone out and fixed or implemented. So he's actually on our fro fo uh, phone frog application. Uh, you can see my my daughters helped us out with the artwork. We're gonna help, we're gonna have higher higher paying um, skilled artists later on. And he actually, I think he said he worked on three pages. He looked at the registration page, the contact page, and login page. So as my Marcel is clicking through that. You can see that we're actually looking at those, again, on the wire efforts. Yeah, so the, the big thing here is that you see I type stuff and there's nothing happening here. Only when I click stuff here, you will see that stuff happens. Anything that does a round trip. That's right. So if you wanted actually to get that interaction, you need to actually use coded UI at the presentation tier. That session is at 2 o'clock. And Prachi Bora is actually, I think, doing it in the room next door to us. OK, so we have our, our recording. At this point, you would probably do a couple of these. You'd go through your different scenarios. And you have, might have five or five. You just finished a big project. How many web tests 
did you end up creating for that effort? Yeah, I think it was about 25 scenarios that we wanted to run. So, and was a scenario equal a web test, or was there be? Yeah, so a scenario equals a web test. That way we can then later on, as you will see, uh, pick different tests and do different distributions on that. OK, so, so we got one web test of a bunch that you would need. At this point, we're ready to actually add that load test. You need to right-click, add choose new item, and now we have a load test. Should we first show them that this actually runs on our machine just as a web test? Absolutely. So this is the thing that you can just use to verify uh, if uh, uh, something that you normally click, click through actually works. And the great thing here is that not only is it following all the links, you can see the response times as well. So here you can see right out of the back uh, pages that are not performing well. And you can also see the number of bytes that are being sent over. So if you have this log on page or something like that with a very tiny picture in there, which should be an icon, but it's a four megabyte uh, image, you can see that right away here. So it's very easy to find if there are any difficulties with the normal web test that you run. OK? So. All right. So now we're at that load test stage. So yep. we're going to go ahead and, and add a new item. And finally, we get to the load test. So click load test. Um, and the first thing it's going to ask us is what kind of scenario we're going to do. So in this case, it might be game acquisition. And Marcel, he was working on an e-commerce ticket site, whatever. Yep. So, or the build scenario. I like that, too. Um, and usually for the, the profiles, what, 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 what would you normally default to? Yeah, so it really depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to break a site, uh, then you should do something like don't, do not use think times. It's like really stress testing your sites. Uh, if you're more looking at, I want to see if I'm going to meet up uh, the load test or the load that I uh, committed to as a developer and say, well, this is normal the distribution that I would have from my users, then I would use just the recorded think times. Um, but if you're using recorded think times, then you more, more or less have exactly the same user going through the exact same page. Well, that's not really the case, right? So you have different users clicking differently. My mom is not as fast as I am clicking on a website, okay? So what you can do, and that's what I would use to really exercise a site, is use the normal distribution. It is a bell curve distribution on the think times that recorded in, the, in, in my web test. And then that will use that to, to uh, float the site uh, with, with requests. Okay. Which brings us actually to the, the next page in our um, wizard, which is going to ask us, how do we actually want to ramp up the load, and how much load do we want to give? Now, in this case, we're running it. The first run that we're going to do is going to be run from, from this machine. So those 25 users that it defaults to are all going to get spun up on that machine. Um, I typically want to actually step it up incrementally. But again, if you're going to do a crash and burn sort of uh, test, hammer it all the way up, up front. And again, we're going to talk about warm-ups as well. But there's, I, you know, there's certain behaviors that only happen after you've got uh, caches loaded. Yeah, so the step load thing is very interesting because that's the way you can see, well, I just created this website, so what is my skill unit, right? So how many users can I actually work with then I, when I see my site go crash and burn and, and just dive, does a nose dive? So uh, that's one, the one that we use when we actually exercise sites and see if they, we can handle the load and if we know how many machines we would need to, well, get something like a first day thing on, on the web. All right, and the next one is actually going to ask us, how do we want to distribute? We're going to add some tests in a second. How do you want to distribute the run of those tests? Um, I typically actually manually set the distribution, but that's not how you guys do it, right? Yes, so there are two things here. So we can now have a, a, a look at the way we are going to distribute the test. So there are, there are four options here. So the first option here is that you just want to run the, normal, uh, the total number of tests. So uh, you will see in the next page that we can set up a, text mi a test mix. So what will happen, it will fire up the number of virtual users that we actually want. And it will make sure that the distribution of those tests meets that criteria that we set at the end of the test. Okay. okay. So let's go ahead and leave it with the, the base and total test. That way we can, we can set the distribution of how we want to actually set it. Yeah. So if you would like to try something different, so one of the things you could also do is do more like a, 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 a test that you would like to do endur endurance testing. So see if you have memory leaks on your server for something or something like that. So what you can do for that is use, for example, uh, things like based on sequential test order or based on user pace. So when you do, do these kinds of things, you can set, well, I just want to run 25 users for, let's say, five days and see how my site is doing and see if you have memory leaks in there as well. Okay. So here we go to the distribution. So at this point, um, we created one web test, but Marcel, I think, actually this morning created a bunch of others. This yeah. is which ones you would want to add. 
So in this case, we want to make sure and check those three pages that Manus said he actually did work with, make sure that they're available and yeah. they're responsive, and if we could add some of your scenarios. So, let's, so let's, a little bit of feedback to the team that this dialogue is not that great, so um, all right. we should fix that a bit, because what I've done, just to come back to that here, well, I will show you later, I, I created a folder with the different scenarios that I was talking about, like login, uh, I had something like clicking on the contact info, and I have this old pages over here that just exercises old pages, and that's what I would like to do for a load distribution and see what, what happens there. But you see it's kind of cumbersome to see that I have different folders laid out in different scenarios that I would just have. So the guy you want to talk to is Jeremy. He's ah, Jeremy, you <laughs> taking notes? <laughs> right. All right. Here's that distribution that we are talking about. Yeah. Um, now in this case, we want to make sure and take a look at those all pages. These are the brand new pages that we added. So we're going to actually skew that one. Can you drag the all pages and drag it way over to the right? So let's have most of our tests being run on that all pages. Yeah, and, and what you will see is that perhaps not so many people will log on to your site, so you want to exercise that a little bit uh, less. And this is the way you set your site up, right? So uh, for the, the, the large gig we did, we had this e-commerce site selling tickets online. So what we had is a first day sell there. So what you will see is that people are browsing the site most of the time, and you have a conversion ratio of about, let's say, 10 or 15% of your good site. And then when you set the actual buy scenario to 10 or 15 percent of all the tests that you would send out. And that gives you the actual distribution that you would expect on, on, on such a launch day. Okay? So, and the uh, network. So the network itself. Actually, the way we do this is we bind a device driver to your network card, and we'll actually throttle the, the bandwidth to your card. This is actually a pretty expensive software item if you were to buy it separate, and we just actually just include it as part of your load test. Um, and I love this one, right? This is just my dad still using a modem, so. And um, now, since it uses a device driver, we are not gonna go ahead and do that because we're gonna make this a cloud-based load test, and you're, you are not gonna, we are not gonna let people install device drivers at ring zero on our VMs up in the cloud. It, it kind of makes sense as to why we're not gonna allow that. So we're not gonna leave that as default. Your guy's a little bit chicken, right? And let's go ahead and add a bunch of the different um, Some browser of types. Favorite browsers. So, um, so what's the distribution these days? Um, we have more like, uh, so, oh, IE11 is not in there yet. That's interesting, by the way. Um, so we have like, so who's still on IE6? Oh, not so many anymore. That's good. Well, I work a lot at enterprises, and dude, I really need to work with IE6 a lot uh, still. Uh, IE8 uh, even, so I will add some of that as well, and of course. Uh, and, and, and what is this doing underneath the covers? Is this is sending the agent header as part of that, that request, right? So. This isn't doing anything magic. This isn't running it as that browser. So this is what, so for, if I would look at developers, then this would be the ratio, right? Everybody using Chrome and a few people using IE and Firefox. At least that's what we see. Um, when you look at the actual customers uh, browsing the web, you still see that IE is a little bit in front. Well, of course, d d d uh, in different regions, it's a little bit different, but uh, that's what we see. And, if you, um, so, and yeah. if you attended Brett's session yesterday on Application Insights, you can figure out exactly what your distribution is. Yeah. Okay. And let's go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, if I wanted to take a look at the performance counters, so I need to actually have access to that machine for maybe my data access layer or my database, I would add them there. Once again, this isn't going to be av available from a cloud load test. So we're going to leave this one empty for right now. But we're going to show you how to collect that data. Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting, if you're doing an on-prem load test, you can add these counters. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to, need to do some network fiddling to actually make the agents go and, and actually, well, access the counters. But one of the great things here is that you're actually fetching all the performance counter data, and it will accumulate in the control. And then you can have very nice insights on how your machines are being hammered and what's and, actually happening under the cover. And we're not going to go into the reporting, but there's actually like a 12-page report that's auto-generated for you as a result of this. OK. Um, next one? Yep. And finally, I talked about the warm-up, how long we're going to run this. We're going to run the first one as an on-premise from this machine to that wherever my website's running from. So we're only going to run it for one minute. We, we don't need to actually sit here for a long time. And again, we're not going to bother with a warm-up because it's only one minute to begin with, and we want to smash the website. Yeah, so one of the important things to note here, if you're doing actual production-like testing, uh, please use warm-up. Uh, because it's not normal that you would hammer a machine with a few thousand users without any caches being filled, okay? If you're doing websites, you're using front-end caches, you're using all kinds of caching strategies in your application, at least I hope so, 
Um, and if, if you're doing that, you need to make sure that first the agent will send out a few requests so it will warm up your caches and then you will hammer the site after the, the, the warm up period is done so you get actual numbers instead of all kinds of spikes and going on and then saturating into the actual uh, load that it's uh, uh, getting. Okay, so click finish. Yeah, click finish and go ahead and run it. Okay. So when you want to run it, uh, the only thing you need to do here is uh, just click this one and it will now fire off a load test on my local machine. Okay, so what you will see what happens, it will initialize the load test controller, um, do uh, an initialization on my local machine of uh, the agent, and the agent is now on my machine firing to an Azure website, but just to be honest, I am in Azure. Uh, so I'm hammering my own machine at this moment, um, so, which is kind of interesting if you set up too much load tests and try to do a demo. So uh, we need to be careful here. Okay, so why are, why are we covering this? Is anybody for a $100 ARC mouse that I've been trying to get since December? I haven't been able to get one. Can anybody tell me what version load testing came out in Visual Studio? Right there, I saw a hand. Uh, this guy, right here in the front row. What? 2012, not even close. Not even close. Right there is a the guy in the gray shirt. Who said 2005? I don't want to kill you. Can you actually hand that to the gentleman two rows back? Why am I talking about a technology that is, it's, I don't know, do the math for me, six, seven years old at this point? Eight years old. Um, why are we doing that? A, because when I do surveys, when I actually do webinars, it turns out there's very, very few people that run it because of the discoverability or maybe the licensing. It's, it's, just, it's not well utilized. But inside of Microsoft, all of our websites, all of our product groups have used this. It's actually around quite a bit longer than since 2005. It's been around as an internal tool. So if you take a look at uh, Visual Studio Online, Bing, uh, TFS. Xbox, right? Xbox, actually, yeah. the, the Hall Gaming Studios uses our load test. So it's probably one of the most mature. It's been around the longest, and it's the least used. And I don't, again, I wanted to make sure that people understood that it was there. And it's the basis for everything else in this talk. I know that we're at 15 minutes, but we're gonna get there. Um, I thought we were hey, even the Santa Tracker. Did you guys, your kids watch the Santa Tracker? No? The Santa Tracker. The Santa Tracker. Hey, Vlad watched it. So that was all load tested beforehand with this. So some guy recorded a couple of these, made sure that it was going to scale out to a couple hundred million kids or whatever the case was. Okay, so it looks like it, it ran, it collected the data. Yep. And I, like I said, this auto generates a big Excel report showing you all of what was happening while, during that load because it actually had access to the machine that it was being run from. Okay, so it couldn't be easier, right? We're at 15 minutes, we created one of these, we load tested our site, it's ready to ship. We're done, right? We're, we're done. Okay, I, yeah. cool. I mean, you guys charge, what, a million dollars a week to do this and it <laughs> takes you six minutes? Yeah, <laughs> we're not telling the customer that. All right, no. so what's, <laughs> what's the reality of getting this from this machine to actually in the real world and actually working. So yeah. is it this easy? No, it is not. All right. Okay, so this is a demo and this always works on your machine. Uh, but if you need to do this in a real world scenario, uh, then you need to have real load. So I'm running this on a small VM. Uh, but if you actually want to do real load distributions and hammer a real site with a few hundred thousand or even million requests, you will not be able to do that from one machine. So one of the great things about the tools, I think, is that we have this notion of creating a test rig. So you can set up multiple machines, and on each of these machines, you install an agent. Okay, now these agents need to be configured, so you need to fiddle around with the network so we can access the performance counters. And then these agents need to talk to what we call a test controller. And a test controller needs to be somewhere as well, and we don't want it to be on the same agent because otherwise we're accu accumulating all the data and hammering that machine. So uh, to, to actually get some data flow in there, you need to uh, yeah, actually install a controller on a different machine as well. So if you take a look at the ticketing side that we've done uh, recently, uh, we needed to fire up 10, 15 of those different machines, needed to install all the agents on there, and then install the controller, uh, which is not trivial, uh, unfortunately. And then uh, we finally were able to run it on those different agents. So it took about one, two days to set up all the machines correctly. And you, you're doing a lot of these tests, and then you see that some of them failing, some of them not getting the performance data, and then you need to figure out what's happening with the network stack and all that kind of uh, do, so I would call I, it. I happen to know the guy that runs that took the two days to do this. It takes him an hour to actually get a brand new TFS instance, upgraded and actually deployed into their infrastructure, yeah. and they use a two-tier model. So baseline, a guy that can actually stand up a TFS instance that's run by 200 people 
from metal yeah. to two hours to taking two days to get 50 machines up. Yeah. Non-trivial, I think, yeah. is the word you're looking for. R Rolf is really an amazing guy. So if you give him a PowerShell without noticing, you have multiple machines spinning. Uh, he even has his own data center at home in his, uh, uh, where you all have the gas meter and all that stuff. And uh, sometimes when we don't have enough machines in our company, then he just fans out to his internal cloud at home. So Rolf doesn't yeah. have a big social life. Yeah, yeah. Well, but he, he's really good at this stuff, so yeah. All right, so there's the reality. I wanted to make sure and temper yeah. my marketing demo with the reality at this point. Okay, so we, we talked about the problems of going out and getting new physical devices, going out and applying the agents, et cetera. At November of last year, we actually, I think we solved that as far as the scale problem. Um, you, you did the ticketing one. By contrast to the 50 machines, was the load test one, did it go a lot faster? What was the contrast? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, 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 you will see later in the demo, right, that uh, uh, actually firing up these machines will be rather easy. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, well, we still charge the customer, of course, the same amount of money, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's the great thing about consulting, right? The right. customer doesn't know what you do as long as you do the right So now thing. you can afford the step-down inverter to power that Xbox One that you just got? <laughs> yeah, well, if, if it had a good su power supply for Europe, that would be yeah. good. Um, all right, if you could go back to your machine, because I actually toggled oh. you to the slides. Sure. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that load test, and we're going to put it out in the cloud so he can scale it up with a, a mouse click to as many machines as he wants. And again, without having to actually go out and buy machines and, and install them. So, so should, I, you, should I start PowerShell now and, and start a lot of commandlets and what, what are the, so it's, it's Log into your Azure portal, yeah, get up right. a bunch of IaaS VMs, no, yeah. no, no. Okay. So, um, by default, there's a file in your solution, in your solution, called local test settings. By default, it's also hidden. So it's not at your project file, where you would have expected, it's at the solution, and it's hidden. So there's, it's almost like an Easter egg on how to find this particular feature. Yeah. If, if Marcel will double click on it, it's, it's the first of an arduous path to actually get this going. Well, maybe not so arduous. It's a radio button. It says, I don't want to run it on this machine, I want to run it out in the cloud. The wizard that he walks through actually has a command that says, how many agents do we want to run it in? Um, every two agents spins up a new VM in our cloud. So if you go out and set up to 50, we'll spin up, or 100, we'll spin up 50 VMs. That's how tough it is. Okay, um, let's go ahead and apply that. And let's set the duration up to 10 minutes or so. Sure. So go here to properties of the run. Then I go here, down here, you will see that I have it set to one minute. So let's make it 10 minutes, right? Is that good? 10 minutes? 10 minutes is good. Okay. And you're going to see why I want to make sure and, and set that duration a little bit. Um, we want to actually get some, data. some background and some data. Yeah. Okay. And go ahead and, and fire this one off. So I'm now doing cl cloud load test. And I just set up a number of machines that will actually run this thing. So what's happening underneath the covers? A virtual machine is getting spun up from the ground, put up into Azure. The load agent or the test agent is getting put in it and it's being handed his web test and the load test. So he could fire Rolf or no, I won't. Let, let, him do, <laughs> let him do other things. And it also discovered that I changed my name today to, so is that actually your name? Charles William Sterling II? Very pompous name, huh? Dude. Wow. You could call me your lord or sir. <laughs> so that's it. That, that is, that's the conclusion of the cloud load testing demo. It is a radio button, guys. Yes, there's an, object, or an option where we can set the agents, but for the user count, we'll actually do the, the, a smart thing and actually span it across your, your VMs as well. And again, this is going to get spun up as I talk. So question, Chuck, is this free for everybody? Or? Try what? Is it free for everyone, or can everybody just do this? It's or? not. It actually, it, it builds out by the, the user minute. Um, I'm not in sales, but if you go to aka.ms forward slash load TFS, oh, I have that. I have that link in the slides, I'll show it to you. It actually has the calculation of what a user minute works out to be in, in terms of dollars. I think you get 1,500 user minutes to begin with. Um, oh, it's just me that has the two million, but. <laughs> I, I, and I get two million, which they figured out that I can't possibly use if I use it every day of every, every part of the month. Um, early adopters get two million. That's, that's what we set it to. Um, so you've got capacity built in as bar, uh, part of being an MSDN. So, we went through a simple, simple demo that is actually pretty far-reaching and has lots of ramifications. Are there any questions on cloud-based load testing until, before we go into the land of tomorrow? Way back there.
Is there any limitations on what? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. Thank you very much for asking that question. So the question was, is there any limit of what kind of site, site sorry Bob, that's my fault, on, on the sites that, um, that you, you can go out and visit. Now, when Marcel was actually recording that web test, I made him go out and go, Dude, I need to not walk around, huh? <laughs> Bob, I'll stand right here if that works. Okay. So the first, the first URL that he hit was bing.com, remember that? We could have had it go to Google or anywhere else on the planet and actually as long as I can record the wire traffic, we can go to that website. This is entirely at the wire and the one that we just showed run was from the outside. So there is a caveat there in that you have to actually be visible from the external web. For instance, we have our MS expense where I actually will submit the, my expenses and all the drinks that we drank last night to this application. Um, they are externally visible. They actually use Kerberos to get into our, our website, so I can actually do this externally. And that's how they load test it. So we do load test our internal applications, but we use that web test, which does a really good job of actually tunneling through and using our own security. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, question right here. All right, so uh, let me see if I can take a run at this. The question is, is, is there a specific type or style of test that I can do from a load test? Um, he saw a different, when he chose add test, he saw a different test in that list, I think. Like he saw unit tests, he saw coded UI, and he saw web tests all listed in there. So do you guys think coded UI is gonna work from an external web source? No, so you can add it to a load test and you can run it from an on-premise environment, not recommended. It's a bad idea, but you can do it. We'll, we'll let you shoot idea. yourself in the foot. Um, but if you're gonna make it a cloud-based load test, it does need to be a web test in order to run. It can't be a unit test and it can't be a coded UI. But if it's gonna be on-premise, sure, we'll, we'll run that off. And if the agent has access to the code, we'll run. So Chuck, to add to that, so one of the things that we've done uh, um, in our test as well is because the, this, this guy had also had a set of uh, external services like SOAP service that they would call into. So one of the things you can do is you can just set up like unit tests that go through an, uh, an, uh, a proxy uh, actually hammering the web service and then you can add those web tests or, or sorry those unit tests as well. So you can create a whole set of tests that are unit tests, web tests uh, and comprise out of that a real life scenario that you would actually expect on your site. That web test recorder that Marcel recorded is incredibly malleable. I mean, it, we talk about extensibility. This thing is actually code underneath the covers. It, it, it is the definition of extensibility. When we actually have the WCF um, load test generator that they, the ALM Rangers, I, any Rangers in the room? Yeah, okay, so what these guys wrote um, is actually looking at the wire and figuring out what it needs to send and actually sending the wire level um, protocols to that. So again, I want, we're about a half hour in, I wanna spend the rest of the half hour stealing Vlad Yovanovich's session. He's right after me. I'm going to see if I can steal all his content from here. So that is load test yesterday, load test today. What did we release at this build conference? Is the integration of load test and application insights. Um, so at the load test level, it's actually um, pretty trivial. If we could go ahead and go back to your machine yeah. and go to the load test definition. Now it was, you have to have Visual Studio up, RC to update two, right? You have to have that. I didn't move, I swear, Bob. I, I, oh, it's that one. I'll sneak back up here where I should be. Get on the podium. Sorry, what? Just get on the podium. I'll get on the podium, I'll stand here. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you guys noticed this, the, the smarter folks noticed that there is actually a new node called applications in the load test um, definition. That wasn't there before update one. In update one, uh, it was hidden behind a feature flag. So you could right click on it. Can you right click on it for us? Yeah, sure. And it would actually, if your account wasn't enabled, you wouldn't actually get any dialogue here. It would just be empty. At update two, as of yesterday, everybody's will say, get application insights to telemetry or monitoring. And let's go ahead and click on 
this. Remember I told you that we're not going to add performance counters from remote machines? And when we ran that cloud-based load test, I don't know if you saw it running, it wasn't collecting the performance counters of that local machine, unlike the first run that we did, right? So what Application Insights does is it gives you that insight information from the machine, much deeper than actually load test did originally. It gives us diagnostics, memory, allocations, objects, et cetera. We're going to take a look at those in a second. And um, we're looking at the Frog app, so you've already got that checked. The reason you can actually check multiples of these is that you actually may use multiple tiers or multiple websites to service one particular load test. In the case of your ticketing um, site, it's really common for like Ticketmaster to use one website to sell tickets and another one to do reviews. Uh, I'm a fisherman, Bass, Bass Pro Shops does that. So they use two different websites. But you would certainly want to include and collect data in your load test run for both. That's yeah, why you can also uh, collect data right from all the other machines that might be uh, worker roles or... Yes, absolutely. So, so cloud services as well. Yeah. Excellent example. Let's go ahead and choose OK. And that was the end of that demo as far as from a load test perspective. We're going to show you on the back end what that means in a second. Let's go ahead and kick this one off as well. Sure. So we can run multiple of these just parallel, right? Right. So they're, they're running in the background in parallel. And you'll see that this one actually says, can you highlight where it says connect to that Visual Studio account in the right-hand corner right here? Perfect. You can see that it actually knows about your Visual Studio online instance which is where we're actually using Application Insights. At this point, um, yeah, let's, one, one important thing to note uh, uh -huh. is that you need to be connected to your Team Foundation server project. Otherwise, you might hit a little glitch in the RC uh, and get a dialog that you cannot understand, and then you need to re, re Which is a lot better than the old behavior. Yeah, because old, it would just. The old behavior would just hang the VS. So again, what Marcel said, make sure that you are connected to your Visual Studio online account before, before you go to actually go out and modify or look at any of the, the um, attributes of your load test. Yeah, and one of the things to note is that if you've not done uh, a lot of stuff with the Team Explorer for, let's say, an hour or two, it might disconnect. So what I will try to do is go to pending changes or whatever other dialogue there, so it will resync then, and then it has an actual connection, and then you're good to go. And that's like an RC glitch, right? It, it should be fixed in the, the final bits. And then in this view, now that we've changed to the view that it's actually running, you'll see there's a new button that wasn't there before called application. Can we go to, to the load test menu? A lot of people didn't know that there's a load test menu because you have to have a load test open to see it. Go to the load test manager, and this is where you'd see actually your team's load tests. And go to the one, we ran one this morning, right? Oh, actually, that one was last oh, night. Yes, yesterday, yeah. E either one of these. Right, yeah, so I'm going to open up uh, 72 because, yeah, that's what we decided to do, right? So I'm double clicking that. Uh, notice the nice UI in um, yeah, yeah. Uh, notifying file, me. File a bug. It, it, if oh. you guys need to file a bug, it's aka.ms forward slash AI bug. So yeah, we should be changing that mouse cursor to actually a weight cursor. Sure. Right. And here, this is actually, the traffic, this is actually the, a look at the test agent from our VM that we spun up. So this is what the agent is doing. This is what the agent is seeing. Now if you click on the application button, this is the new button by us going out. It is contacting, well that was fast, it was contacting Application Insights and saying, give me the performance counter of the machine under load. In this case, this is production. Well, as production as me and Modis is going to get. This is out there. If you looked at the URL for the Frog app, you guys could all hit it, and you can actually go out and spike the app. And this is what's happening. And but since we're doing production stuff, you'll see spikes in weird behavior that has nothing to do with your load test, because this is real world stuff. Ma um, Marcel this morning was saying, the machine's really slow. What, what is happening? It turned out Marcel, or uh, Modis in India was taking a look and writing some code and doing some check-ins. So yeah. I, I think the trend is that people are going to be testing in production. But again, there's some non-deterministic behaviors as a result of that. OK, this is pretty cool stuff. I, I, I don't know if you guys realize that, but what we're going to do is we're going to go out and take a look at it from the other side. This is one very, very narrow view of that application under load. And this is where I'm going to steal some of, of Vlad's um, content. So in that so, link, so who, who likes this stuff? He thinks it's cool. OK, great. OK, that, so, that guy didn't like it. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. I need to track him down. So um, I think this is a weird view as well. This should be popped out in a separate page. But what's happening here is that it's going ahead and actually loading my application insights for, well, in this case, it decided it's the wrong app. 
That wasn't good. It should actually change it to the frog app. Really? It usually it does. I don't know why it's done that today. But uh, Marcel's going to grab that URL. We're going to pop it out into a full window for us. Can you do that for us, Marcel? Sure. And we're not looking at the Chaz app. So let's hit the drop down right here. Oh, yeah. And, and choose frog. Sure. I don't know why that load test decided to look at Chaz. I, Probably I selected the wrong one. OK. <laughs> so this is a, another view of the exact same data that our load test generated. And, it, and if you take a look at it, it's pretty easy to figure out where the load tests were, and actually, in some cases, where the load tests weren't, right? So, so this, 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 is this, this spike, go right there and highlight that one, that's not caused by a load test. I can see that, yes, my request bounced up a little bit, yeah, but, but nothing like I'd expect from a load test. So here you see the blue line that, well, it's now red, of course, but that's, that's the user load that you have, OK? So here we see these insane spikes. So, so my SQL Server, yeah. something is hitting it at that point. Actually, can you scroll down? I don't think it's my SQL Server. Look at the dependencies. Blue is, oh, it's that old school ASMAX call. So right. I've actually called out to some web services, and this one happens to be running in a community college in Indiana. Sometimes he bounces me off, probably when I run, run load tests. And sometimes other people use that. Well, it's probably running on like a 386. Remember ASMAXs back in the day? So just to emphasize here, right? So you see that it knows the dependencies of your website. It now shows that the website that the guys built is, is going to easylearning.com, is going to W3 schools. And here you see that this ASMX, which is the blue one over here, so the blue dot over here, which is a little bit different than the blue dot over there, I think, um, is actually hitting uh, this stuff over here. So, and again, the blue spikes that we see, the spikes go to the top, those are our load tests that we, me and Marcel were playing with. Yeah. Our modest kicked off, one of the two of us. Um, the other interesting data here is the, 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 the calls that took the longest, right? This is about capacity plan and performance. Which ones took the longest? And you can see right off the bat, hey, this SQL call is, all, is out, of, out of scope. It's kind of crazy, crazy. Interesting. Yeah. So you, you hired an intern, or what, what, what's you happening You can tell here? I was in the SQL team. Oh, OK, right. You, you, don't, you don't get Transact SQL like that through education. Okay. So let's go ahead and click on the top 10 slowest, and we'll take us into what else is happening. By default, since we clicked on the top 10 slowest, it filtered it to a performance. Where does it say performance right there? Yeah. And so we could actually go ahead and say, I want to look at all the different issues. I have performance, memory, exception. Um, and we can choose all. We can actually see those different types. Yeah. I don't have memory turned on on this machine because it was just kind of inundating the machine. It's a pretty small box. I have it set to a, a small instance Azure. Yeah. And the way that works is once you get to 90% of the memory um, in IIS, you set out how much memory an app pool can use. Once you get to 90%, we'll grab a Diag session and go ahead and throw a memory alert. And that Diag session shows you everything that's in memory. So if you get a couple of these, I can go out and compare to see what's growing. Yep. And I, I've got that turned off. In this case, uh, let's go ahead and expand out that one slow call. And in this case, if I, it, was, it wasn't quite as obvious as this, I might want to do a real-time debug session or actually dig into the code. Yeah. Almost certainly I would. Let's go ahead and open up the latest one of those calls, probably from this load test. And you'll see that if he expands out the stack down the bottom, I get everything that was in this page load, every call that I made in that page load. This is pretty cool. And I get a web experience. If you guys have got an ops team, they can take a look at it and say, you know, it's, it's probably the big blue one that's highlighted. Guys, you probably got a problem here. And as a developer, you would actually get a link to this. And going all the way back up to the top, I can actually open up this in Visual Studio. So we'll see where it says um, download Visual Studio iTrace file. Well, it said download IntelliTrace, which is interesting that we get IntelliTrace with it. But I, I think they mean the file, right? I, I think it's the file. Yeah, OK, cool. All right. So, so just to point out here, so now it's, of course, obvious that we have a, a, a performance issue here that my machine is slowing down. So one of the things that I see most in websites, what's happening, if you call out to, let's say, an ASMX website, then you see that there's nothing going on in the box, but still you cannot handle the number of uh, connections coming in. And it has to do with the fact that you're calling out to something that is uh, latency bound. Yeah. Uh, your actually request pool in IIS is bound, what is it, 25 or whatever uh, number of threads that can handle incoming Request and all of a yep. sudden, your web server is going to throw 503 errors saying, Service Well, I'm, I'm, dude, I'm so busy, I cannot handle it. Well, the CPU load is still 0%. Yep. 
And this view of that iTrace file, what happened to it? Did it get opened? Yeah, so uh, I will open it. Shut, okay. Shut, shut um, my mouth and open since it. Since we're actually not in a, an exception, but rather actually in a performance event, it will give us the hot path right through your call stack to that particular problem. Oh, and let's, let's, before we get there, let's talk about, we actually have an enhanced IntelliTrace. Go scroll all the way back to the top of the IntelliTrace, so in Visual Studio. And you'll see that there's now a gold bar. Oh, yeah. And the gold bar is pretty important. In this world of operations, we might be looking at an exception that happened a couple months ago or a couple days ago, whatever the case is. Maybe a build that you don't have on your machine and symbols that you don't have easy access to, i.e. The, the, the operations team that you guys work with. What this is going to do, that link that says, hey, you don't have the symbols, but I can get you to the change set. I know when you actually went ahead and did that deployment what change set it came from. I'll give you the change set. And so it'll create that local workspace and it'll give you that environment. And if you did have the symbols actually available to you, and we can step to code. And we'll show you the step to code so as well. I, I think I should elaborate a little bit on symbols. Because what I learned doing IntelliTrace demos as well is that not everybody knows what symbols are. Okay? So one of the important things that you need to know is once you compile, you make music with them, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So it's like music on a sheet, right? Yeah, no. So the thing is, once you compile in a C-sharp compiler or a VB compiler, whatever you're using, it's generating the IL code. It's also generating this PDB file. And this PDB file contains the symbols. And the symbols are there for a debugger to actually know which line of IL translates in which line of C-sharp code. Now, the fun thing is, is once you're using, let's say, TFS build services, the great thing is that it will know that you generated those symbols and it will shovel them off to a symbol server. Um, and that's very useful in your organization because then all of a sudden um, the, in, the, the PDB files are indexed so that they know which chain set they go into. And that way is now also the PDB back to your TFS server chain set and that gives you a very great experience in terms of going back in time because normally you're not working on the stuff that's online at the moment. It's just two months right. out. You, so. you, you didn't deploy that minute, right? Right. right. Not everybody's deploying just directly to their IS server. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at, hit cancel here, and go back to the IntelliTrace file. So this is the IntelliTrace file. Oh, sorry. And then go ahead and look at the... View details? Or? Yeah, view details. Sorry, yes. So this is going to give us information, and I talked about that hot path. So we made a couple calls, and obviously this is the path down to the one that actually took the longest. At this point, you actually can go ahead and choose debug this call. Yeah, so here you see the link, debug this call. And, and that takes us to the top of the stack for this performance issue. Yeah, and the great thing is you see the full syntax that's being fired to the SQL server over here. So you can, uh, I'm not sure, did they fix that that uh, I can grab it? No. So I can do a copy here, right? Yeah, so just do a copy, and then you paste it in your SQL Explorer or whatever and see what's actually going on. So this one doesn't take, Needs, you, know, you don't need to be a rocket science to see that this is not a, quite a thing you should do. Okay, so let's recap. I showed you last, uh, load TFS from, or <laughs> load test from yesterday. Yep. I showed you load test for today. I showed you load test as of this week and going forward. Um, and this kind of concludes the load test part. But, I mean, in this real world scenario, we added three pages. We load tested them and maybe we fixed it. In this case, it's commenting out or removing some bad SQL statements. And we want to check that back in. And those three pages, you want to make sure they're always available and they're always fast. So Vlad's going to cover this in an hour right after I've got, but right after I get off the stage. But we're going to actually take that um, full circle back to your operations team and show you how you're going to make sure that they're always available, those pages. So if you go ahead and go back into um, Application Insights. So I'm going to close this one. Uh -huh. And I'm going to availability. Availability, yeah. And you'll see that we're looking at the Frog app. And we have a couple of these tests already. Now, why don't you open up the all pages? And go ahead and click on one of the, the data points for the all pages. So what this is telling us is, um, why don't we see the calls down the bottom? We should be seeing steps here. Yeah. So we take another one. The, 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 that's a URI test, so we're not going to see it. Oh, so right. what I expected on all pages, and I'm not certain why I'm not seeing it, is when Marcel clicked on one of the synthetic transaction points of presence that ran, so we're not even getting a rendering here, um, you should actually see every step in your web test. Okay. So this is actually Dude. 
Oh, you know what happened? There was already one called All Pages. Oh, it just that was collect- a, that was a URI test, oh, and boy. you happened to have a name collision. Okay, oh, okay so. cool. So, well, we well, let's add one. We'll, we'll just we'll just add yeah. one. We'll show it that way. So let's add a new availability test. So here, the difference between a single URL test and a multi-step one. So the single URL is just, so the whole thing is here, you uh, have this web test set up and you would like to exercise this every now and then on your site to see if still, stuff is still working good. Not actually load testing the site, but seeing if the availability is there, so if the pages are actually rendering. So you can do it with a simple URL test, which is just going out to fetch one page and you can verify if some text is on the page, for example. Or we can do this multi-step web test uh, and we can give that a uh, unique name. Can you either make the window smaller or try and drag that dialog up? Yeah, so. Um, this is our fault, by the way. This is not Marcel. Control minus sign will actually get you. Yeah, done. we'll show how we okay. do that, right? So, <clears throat> this way, and then zoom in later. Um, so, you see that I'm typing in the unique name. And the great thing here is that there are all these data centers out there which run Azure. So I can just point and click and see what are my favorite regions or where are my most customers coming from. And based on that, I say, well, I've got a lot of guys coming from Singapore who are uh, afraid of frogs, perhaps. Um, we got Amsterdam. They love frogs. They lick them, right? It's like uh, having um, mushrooms and all that stuff that we what, have. What you do in your private time. Oh, okay, don't, sorry. We don't need to know. Um, and uh, we hammer it from Miami as well. And uh, then we can say, well, how many times do you want me to test that uh, in terms of frequency. So we can set it to five minutes or 10 minutes. We just keep five. And the great thing is, if, if stuff breaks, we can send emails. To Vlad J. So who? Vlad J. Vlad J. Yeah, yeah. Vlad. I'm tired of getting Vlad these notifications J. from my application. At Microsoft.com? Yeah. At Microsoft.com. Cool. And did you go to browse and choose your website? No, not yet. So not yet, because I didn't explain that yet. Okay. So, so the, the whole thing is that we already set up these web tests uh, that I just recorded. So the great thing now is that I can say, well, these are my most important and critical scenarios I want to check. For example, can I buy a ticket or not, for, uh, in our case? Um, so then I go browse here, and I can go to this all pages web test, which I recorded previously. And just to show you what's in there, um, what I've done here, and that's rather important if you set up these monitors, is uh, here you see the Bing search that I did, and then you see that I'm going to the frog page over here. So just zoom in a little bit. So here you see the frog page. And what I've done is I added this thing called transactions. Okay, so what I can do is I can just right click uh, here and say I would like to add a transaction. And the reason I'm doing that is because that will show up in my uh, log later on. So I will ni- very nicely see which scenario I ran, and based on that, I can see where stuff breaks. Okay, so that's the one I'm loading up now um, in um, the App Insights uh, environment. So clicking OK, and it should upload it to the server, and then it will go out to all the data centers and then all of a sudden start more or less running those web tests from those agents that are there, um, going to my site and collecting information on how my site is doing. So if I've set this up, for example, for my blog site. I set it up for the ticketing side and all that stuff just to, uh, well, get early warnings that stuff is breaking. Okay. So guys, we're at 45 minutes after the hour. Um, I want to conclude with the fact that a lot of people have been asking, what is this Visual Studio Online? What, it's kind of a weird name. What is, what is the, the aspirational goals of this? The aspirational goals of Visual Studio Online is to make every facet of the development um, practice to simply merge and snap together. So what you saw here was you actually saw where we took what operations might do, or actually test. We started with a test um, persona, um, went out and did some of their effort, merged seamlessly back into the diagnostics um, workflow of developers, and used that exact same work and handed it to operations. So this is the, again, the vision of Visual Studio Online is to make sure that every tool that each of you use actually goes out and adds value to the person that you're working next to without adding any, any sort of friction. There are great tools in this space in their silos. I mean, what are we looking at? We're looking at um, 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 uh, the availability test. What, uh, time is out there, it does a great job. Can I go out and use my web test, and can my developers actually go out and debug any issues with it? I don't, I don't know, but I know it wasn't designed that way. It was designed to actually go out and take a look at silos. So this is what Visual Studio Online is all about, is making sure that everything snaps together. So for the guys that came out to the booth the last two days, I want to thank you very much. We had about 1,000 downloads of the Visual Studio V6. 
Um, if you haven't downloaded that, this is by far the easiest way to get started with Application Insights. Uh, we gave out, I think it was 10 headsets. One person hasn't co uh, collected theirs. So if Brian Black is in the audience, we've got your $150 headset in the back corner over there. Otherwise, right there, the gentleman waving his arms, I think. Um, for everybody else, I know that there were other questions that I didn't take. We've got about 12 minutes before Vlad's going to get set up. Any questions? So right here are the glasses. I would walk over there, but I've learned not to do that. So maybe I could get, hey, Jeremy, can I get you to, um, I'm going to hand you a, a lab mic. And but there are two mics over there. So if ah, you can okay, just okay, go perfect. to the mic uh, so that the recording also captures the questions, yeah. um, that would be pretty important. So I'm, I'm a bit new to this, but um, is there any security involved that, like, could I just low test anybody's website? So that like, it, wouldn't, wouldn't that be like the same as like so a that, denial that, service attack? On so could something? you create a denial of a service attack using our tools? Absolutely. Is there anything to keep you from going to Google or actually going out and writing those requests yourself? No, and you could do that. Um, you could actually get much more malicious because the web test makes it very easy to actually for you to do things like sign in and fake personas. So could you? Yes. Hopefully your due diligence and Mm -hmm. You being a good developer won't do that. There's, there's nothing to keep you from using tools maliciously. Yeah. I think so any tool. One of the things to note is we know where you came from. We know <laughs> where you live. So, yeah. Well, I, I think it's much more important about it, and we will bill you for the usage. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So if, I, I if, if you the... want to pay us for your denial of the service attacks, yeah. uh, Matt, most of it's back there. I'm, I, I think it'd have to accept your money. He may even help you write the web tests. I just had one other quick question is, if you're, if you're trying to uh, test a website that has a data write uh, component to it, is there a way that you can you know, do a dependency injection or some kind of mock of the, of, the write, of the database write scenario so that you don't actually write to your database? Or, like if you're doing a ticketing app and you want to test the actual purchasing of a ticket, you don't want to get yeah. hundreds of tickets purchased, you just want to. This is what int environments are for. This isn't going to solve that particular problem. I mean, yes, you could go out and do uh, you could, we didn't show this, but those web tests, there's actually a button that says generate code, and you could actually do pound, um, uh, pound statements in there and go out and change it. Yes, yeah, so, so it's over here. So you can hear, what is it, uh, generate the code. It's the one that, that looks one. like a clock, I think. No, it's that one. It's the yeah. brew and then some lines of code. So if you generate the code, you can do anything you'd like. You get like the test initialized, and you can then uh, say, well, I'm going to do dependency injection on my framework and, and do something with that or change configs and, and make that work. But be sure that you're doing that, not doing that in production, right? So we're, we were talking about the production type of load testing. Uh, but if you're doing that in an environment that you say, well, I want to mock out the database because my, my database is always the fastest, I, I don't care, then in that particular case, you could mock that out in some way or form. But it, 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 it's a little bit of fiddling around to make that work. It's not out of the box experience. Okay, but it's just a web test, so you can do anything Again, you want. Again, like. extensibility and being able to be morphed was one of, one of the earliest requirements because it is a tool that we use internally. J thank you very much. Jump. Oh, actually, I think I have like three mice left. Oh, wow. There you go. Right here. Yeah, my question was related to we use web services, but we have a lot of front ends, be it WinForms and two different mobile clients. Uh -huh. Is there any way to capture the traffic without being yeah. in Internet Explorer? Yes, you can. So not on Internet Explorer. So if you want to exercise SOAP services, you need to go to CodePlex, where this uh, Rangers project is. So what you can do is you can turn on in WCF, uh, Windows Complication Foundation, or what was it? Um, you can there turn on. Uh, this notion of diagnostics, okay? And then you can import a trace file and generate web tests from that, okay? So that will exercise your SOAP calls based on that. Uh, the other way around is just generating proxy, uh, doing a unit test-like thing, and then add that to uh, the, the, the whole that, that, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, Sorry? Sounds, that sounds like a lot of work to build a proxy with thousands of calls. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we're going to take, take one more question from this side. And we're going to be up here, so we'll keep answering questions, but sure. I want to give the stage to uh, Vlad. So right here. Yeah, my question is is around security as well. So um, I've lo I've done load tests in the past, and one of the trickiest part is when you have your agent in one domain and your web server in another domain. So yep. um, how does this change this cloud thing change 
or is it is makes it any... harder because you're always coming on as an external entity you're not even coming in you couldn't set up a trust from one domain to the other so it makes it harder but there are knowledge based articles on how you would actually go out and, and set your identity in the web test but that KB article I actually helped write it is like five years old it works I know it works mm -hmm. but it not only does it not help, it makes it harder because now the world is based on a cloud and everybody has no identity coming in from that, sp that space. Yeah, so it's not really a solution for cross-domain in your own enterprise. I mean, this is more like you're on uh, uh, an Azure environment or uh, something that you cannot ask the performance counters and then you can use App Insight. Mm -hmm. uh, based on that, you can get the performance data, but there's no way you can just cross or bridge uh, the networks. And if we fix that, this guy over here that was asking how do I do denial of service attacks would be excited because then we <laughs> can actually fake identities by default. Right. So come up and get your mouse. I want to thank you guys for waking up at 9 a.m. I want to thank you guys for coming to Build. I want to thank you for actually being customers of Microsoft. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.